super excited. I am ready to rumble. Uh, the nuclear revolution has come in to its share of incoming fire these last several years from our own SSP colleagues even. Daryl, Brendan, who's here with us, Mark Bell and others. Uh, and who better to discuss or help us lead us in the discussion of this than Charlie Glazer, who is often found in the footnotes of the critiques as a defender <laughs> of the revolution. Marx, Engels, and Glazer. <laughs> in the interest of getting straight to what I expect will be very interesting, I will dispense with the introductions. We all know who Charlie is and we love him. And so we will go straight to the talk. I will then facilitate question and answer in my preferred style. <laughs> so that is one question per person until everyone has had a chance to ask a question. I will go last as a demonstration of my commitment. And then if we finish that round and everyone gets to ask a question, then we will go to a second round. Uh, well, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the estimable Charlie Glass. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Good to be here. It's especially good to give this talk at MIT. I took my first uh, course on nuclear weapons here when I was uh, at the Kennedy School. It was 1980 from George Rations and Jack Rowena. Um, and I'm also glad to be giving this talk because... Um, as Jim said, um, there's most the vast majority of critics of the theory of the revolution, nuclear revolution have been produced by SSP um, or other people who are here. So it's sort of interesting. So, you know, down there, you know, you're reading this and you're going like, what are they teaching people at MIT? I mean, what is going on up there? Um, but anyway, having looked at the arguments more carefully, I think there's, a, you know, a lot of a, a, we've learned a lot from this work. And I'm just going to go through and try to explain where I stand on it. It's a bit of a tricky talk to give because if you're not immersed in this, I can't tell you how, what I think about it without telling you what it is. So I'm going to tell you what the theory, how I understand the theory of the nuclear revolution, do it sort of quickly, go through the critiques, and then some sort of assessment or bottom line. Um, so it's also useful, hopefully, because for the, particularly for those of you who are younger scholars, I think there is a tendency to think that what, what was written recently is true. So since the last decade is the attack on the nuclear revolution, and you might not have even have read about the nuclear revolution, you probably think that the new state of understanding is the, the correctness of the attack, um, which I think is mostly wrong, but there is a grain of truth in it, and we need to sort of, I'm going to give some, I mean, I think there is some important ground to give, and I'm going to try to show where I think that all that sits. Um, so let me, I'm going to go sort of quickly. I have, I know my slides once again, showing that I'm older, just turned 70, way too many words, no pictures. Um, okay, so what is the theory of the nuclear revolution? I mean, broad terms, it holds that nuclear powers can maintain assured destruction capabilities, that arms races should be mild, um, and deterrence is relatively easy. And I'm going to go into detail about um, you know, what supports that. But that's the basic argument. You're going to be in MAD. You're going to have mutual vulnerability. Um, it's inescapable and so forth. The critics hold no that maintaining assured destruction capabilities is hard, maybe not even possible. Um, competition is valuable. And very importantly, even if you don't succeed in gaining a damage limitation capability, which I think is the best argument, um, and deterrence can be quite difficult. And so you need this additional advantage or capability. So what's at stake in this debate? First of all, US nuclear policy. If you believe or accept the basic tenets of the nuclear revolution, you shouldn't engage in arms races. Um, the United States should accept the vulnerability of other states. Um, and sh we should let China and Russia acquire sure destruction capabilities. Um, but on the, also a question is how secure is the United States? If you're really worried about these critiques, Maybe U.S. security is also not as great as we think. Maybe somebody's going to take away the U.S. assured destruction capability for reasons that have been put out there. So these are the basic, the stakes are quite high. Um, as I've said, I think the critics have way overstated their case, but there's a grain of truth. And I'm going to try to say, you know, what I, where I think that lies. Um, in the end, I come down quite strongly still that we should not engage in this sort of damage limitation or pursuing damage limitation capabilities, um, even with the amendments that I will accept um, or take on board. Okay, 
I'm gonna, I divide, and I'm not going to have time to go into it today, but I, I do divide the, the theory of the nuclear revolution into two parts, what I'm going to call the core and a variety of subsidiary arguments. Um, and the core is sort of the internal logic of mutual vulnerability. So the argument is that superpowers will gain assured destruction capabilities um, in, an ex in an extended competition, um, and that they'll be able to preserve those capabilities. And that consequently, it doesn't make any sense to compete. Right? If you knew that basically the equilibrium was going to be mutual vulnerability, then why try to take it away? And so given that you shouldn't have arms competition, it doesn't mean you couldn't build forces that would try to make the adversary's forces more vulnerable, but the adversary will respond. You're going to end up where you started in terms of vulnerability. So you should just accept it. Um, and if you look at this, um, then that means a whole variety of things that the United States does and other states do also we shouldn't do. So you shouldn't engage in strategic ASW, you shouldn't pursue missile defense, you shouldn't, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, put it in, in more general terms, um, nuclear weapons create a really large advantage for defense, but in, where defense means deterrence. And so it's way easier to deter that, um, and in this case, maintain these retaliatory capabilities and then to take them away. This essentially eliminates a security dilemma. Deep, deep defense dominance means there's, the security dilemma is eliminated. So this means that the nuclear revolution provides an additional kind of security. It means not only that you have very good deterrent capabilities, but that you can actually make yourself secure without undermining the adversary's security. Um, and that's a major benefit in terms of dealing, you know, how we, um, operate in the international system. As a result of, the, of that what preceded, it means that force size doesn't matter. If you have larger forces than I have, you don't have a better nuclear capability because you don't have an, a better, you can't inflict more damage and you can't protect yourself. So force size doesn't matter, force type doesn't matter very much. And I'm glossing, there are sort of all sorts of qualifications, but that would be the basic argument. And then finally, the logic of bargaining in mutual vulnerability is the logic of counter-value bargaining. So there is an argument out there, which I accept that countries need um, to have limited nuclear options, even in mutual vulnerability, for a variety of reasons. Among other reasons, all out nuclear attacks are not credible because of the mutual vulnerability itself. There may be credible limited options. And one of the key arguments during the Cold War was, given that you need limited options, you need counterforce because limited options have to be counterforce. But that last step is wrong. Um, there's no use to have counterforce, even limited counterforce, if you can't limit damage. So all uses of nuclear weapons, to the extent that there should be any, and maybe there should be none, would be to inflict costs, communicate resolve, um, and try to convince the adversary to back down. Um, so yes, limited nuclear options, although the, many theorists would not necessarily put much weight on them, um, but you should, uh, if you need them, they should be counter-value. Um, anyway, there was a huge debate that took place um, during the 70s and 80s about this basic logic. Um, to its credit, most of the theory of the nuclear revolution or the critics don't engage in the 1970s and 80s debate. They're actually making a much more fundamental set of arguments, um, which I'll come to. Um, okay, so one thing to point out about the theory is there are claims, sometimes overstated, but claims about the relative ease, or why would we believe you can keep an assured destruction capability? So I just want to tick these off. They're, they're in a sense, they're just sort of like the implicit empirical background of the theory. Um, so basically, nuclear weapons, why, why would you expect this competition to lead to mutual vulnerability? And so that's a standard list, right? Nuclear weapons, particularly thermonuclear weapons, do a huge amount of damage. There aren't many targets. Unlike when you're trying to attack forces, if you're trying to attack value targets, um, which is, say, populations, but maybe just critical infrastructure targets, there just aren't many targets. So you're in the category of tens or 100 targets, and you've got thousands of weapons. And so the challenge to the defender or the damage limiter is tremendous. Wealthy states can build thousands or tens of thousands of weapons. They can deploy them all sorts of different ways, which makes destroying them harder because you have to defeat each type of delivery system. 
Missile defenses don't work, and they still don't work, and they're probably never going to work when we think about national missile defenses. We know from watching these the recent conventional wars, you can have their conventional missile offenses that work, but national missile defenses are totally different um, without going into it, partly the speed of the warhead, but most importantly because the trajectory is in the, um, in the basically the atmosphere, the vacuum of the upper atmosphere. And so it's a whole different problem for a variety of reasons. Um, and importantly, when, particularly when these arguments were made early on, um, forces were really quite highly survivable. You can make missile silos hard enough that um, until the end of the Cold War, they weren't vulnerable, or they were foreseeably becoming more vulnerable. Um, bombers on alert um, would survive as long as they had tactical warning, and they would almost always, in a realistic scenario, have strategic warning. Um, submarines could patrol vast swaths of the ocean, and physicists told us that you could make your submarines so quiet that you couldn't find them against background noise. Um, so they were going to survive. So this was the basic argument. Some of these things turned out to be not quite right um, or in practice, although they were right in theory. So that's a problem. Um, <laughs> um, then there are the subsidiary claims, which I'm going to say less about. But I, I put them up here because many people associate the theory of the, never, of, theory of the nuclear revolution with Jervis's book um, on the theory of the re nuclear revolution. Well, he actually uses that terminology, and other people used it before then, and they used it more narrowly, and they were often referring just to the core arguments that I've mentioned. But there are a variety of other political arguments that we're separating out because they all, as I'll show in the next slide, they involve claims that go beyond the core. They require additional arguments, some of which I think were exaggerated, and I can go into you know, in question and answer maybe why they were exaggerated. Um, or oversimplified. Um, but name anyway, it, peace between the superpowers is one of the most standard predictions that obviously, fortunately, so far holds. Um, crises will be rare. I'm going to go through the logic for each of these. But this is all, in, there's a quote. If you look at like the discussions of Jervis's book, there's this one paragraph. It has all these points in it. If you read his chapter, it's actually much more nuanced than what he says in the paragraph. People quote the paragraph, they lose the nuance of the chapter. Um, that's not unfair. He wrote it that way. But anyway, neither side will press advantages. The status quo is easy to maintain. And political outcomes, importantly, will not be related to the nuclear balance or the conventional balance. This is all often said. I think some of these are not quite right. I think the core is way stronger. But just here on the logic of each of them, um, how do you get from the core to these conclusions? Basically, not surprisingly, High risks and high costs play an incredibly important role in deterring war, in deterring crises, um, and also in making states reluctant to press bargaining advantages because eventually you could incur the very large cost. An additional factor, which may not always be true, but is often true, but importantly is not always true, is that defenders value the status quo more than the side that's trying to change the status quo. To the extent that that true is true, defenders have a bargaining advantage, which reinforces the status quo, um, and it reinforces the implications of high risks. Nuclear differences don't matter for outcomes, right? That actually follow that does follow directly from the core. If differences within mutual, you know, within your force structure don't matter, as long as you're in MAD, then outcomes shouldn't matter, shouldn't depend at all on the nuclear balance. That's sort of like that's tautological in a sense. But why conventional war um, might escalate to nuclear war, so that means also, according to this logic then, and since nothing matters at the nuclear level, then the conventional balance doesn't matter. That's probably wrong. Um, and so that would be like on one of the amendments that I would make, um, which is not one that's the focus of the, um, of the critics especially, but I think that Jervis was really focused, one thing to keep in mind is he was very focused on a lot of people who were working at the time were very focused on the US-Soviet situation and what that meant was a large conventional war in Europe. And this probably applies much more to that large conventional war in Europe than it would in general to the irrelevance of conventional forces, let's say for limited aims elsewhere. And, and this gets us into the, some of the complexities and of the stability and stability paradox and so forth. But I would just say these are this is the long list, and these are the basic logics for the what I'm calling the subsidiary claims. 
So either you've seen this before and it's been really boring or you haven't seen it and I've gone too quickly. I don't know how many would be in the middle, but in any event, we'll just have to move on. <laughs> um, okay, so one argument that I wanna take off the table is that some critics of the theory of the nuclear revolution have said, well, the United States and the Soviet Union didn't follow what the theory says they should, so the theory's flawed. Um, that's wrong, actually, this, the, the, in the sense that the, the, the people who were developing these arguments knew that the United States was not pursuing these, the policies that, were predicate, that, it, that the theory was calling for. Um, and they tried to explain it in any variety of other ways, although not fully. There's no really full explanation, I think, of the divergence between US policy and the theory of the nuclear revolution. Um, but the, it's, it's not really a flaw in the theory. The theory is, is prescriptive um, and it was known. Um, so that just take, we'll take that one off the table. That's not the, that's not the issue here. There's three other strands, I think, and I'm oversimplifying, and then there are other issues about, but I'm just gonna focus on these three. One is that um, particularly Keir Lieber and Daryl Press have argued that technology is making counterforce and damage limitation more feasible. Um, and Brendan's work with Austin also is you know, consistent with this, but a little different. Um, and I'll talk about each of these in order. Um, second, and this is the Brendan Green Austin log argument, the Soviet Union had great difficulty maintaining its assured destruction capability. And so how do we square that with um, the, the claims of the theory of the nuclear revolution, which says at a minimum, it says states will be able to maintain their assured destruction capabilities, but it does have this spirit, if not the explicit statement in many cases, that it will be easy. Ken Waltz, who exaggerated many things in his work, said it would be easy. <laughs> he said like, you know, you're easy to build, easy to hide, easy to deliver, whatever else was easy, just easy. Well, you know, it turned out that the real world wasn't really quite like that. But other people who looked at it much more carefully um, also thought it was, you know, it was, the, it was the high likelihood near certain outcome. But that's rather different than easy. And there's a third argument, which is my favorite, and Brendan is here today, so I have to admit it. I think he's nuclear stalking me. I don't know why he came today. Um, maybe they send out spies like these critics, like they go out and they spy on all the nuclear talks, and then they think, oh, there's a new argument out there. We better respond to that one or something. I don't know. But in any event, I like this argument, um, that there might be advantages, even if you can't um, acquire a damage limitation capability. And specifically, as I'll explain when I get to that slide, if you can create uncertainty in the adversary's mind, even if you haven't succeeded, it will be valuable. So we'll go through each of these then and sort of show how they, what they say or what I think they say. And then, okay, so the Lieber and Press, you know, basically a new era of counterforce. Um, in a variety of ways, counterforce is getting easier, they say. Um, one thing I think it's widely accepted, it was foreseeable. We knew it in the, end, in the 1980s that silos were gonna become highly vulnerable. That was pretty, I mean, people who did the calculations on, on MX knew that. So there's not a lot new in this claim, although the United States, ha as they explained, has continued to in further improve the accuracy of its missiles. Um, states have gone to mobile missiles. So now there are, break there are breakthroughs and I'm not, um, in the ability, um, to track mobile missiles. Um, to some extent, this is still emerging. It's not, it, the capability is there, it, the technological capability is there, the assets are not deployed. But basically now you can deploy large numbers of small satellites so that there's always a satellite looking everywhere. That's very different than when you had a small number of satellites and there are gonna be gaps. Um, and obviously if you're tracking something, having no gaps but when you're watching really matters because you can hide during gaps, but if there's constant tracking, you can't. Um, you can deploy space-based radars on these small satellites using it. Um, technology I don't understand, but I can say all the terminology. Now you can put small space-based radars up there. So you can have um, day-night, all-weather reconnaissance of mobile missiles. Um, and there's a huge amount of data involved, but now also communications allows for the transmission of that data and for the evaluation of it. Um, so without that, it wouldn't be possible and it's still tricky and, um, but anyway, so those are all new, that's different and it means that states have a plausible chance of tracking or maybe even a good chance of tracking 
um, mobile missiles, um, but only if there aren't countermeasures. So that's, a, that's what we would have to come back to. Um, and countermeasures are always an important part of the offense-defense argument. I mean, even in missile defense, it used to be said, well, you can't hit a bullet with a bullet. Well, now we can essentially hit a bullet with a bullet. But if we don't know where the bullet is or which one of the multi many things that looks like a bullet is a bullet, um, then it becomes potentially impossible. Um, the submarines, they sort of wave their hands at the submarine issue. Um, they say, well, we were able to track Soviet submarines during the Cold War and new stuff is happening. Um, there's a lot less out there on the new stuff that's happening in, in ASW, but there are um, autonomous vehicles and a whole variety of sensors and once again, huge amounts of data collection. Um, so the ASW problem is changing, although I think the bottom line, certainly in the US case, um, is that the SSBN, SSBNs will be survivable for the foreseeable future. Um, but anyway, then, so leave, they have this whole argument, and then there's this very important statement, which I think they actually mean, which is that, but countries that have considerable resources can buck these trends and keep their forces survivable, albeit with considerable effort. So what the, I mean, I read that to say you can maintain your assured destruction capability if you're a major power. But what you can't do is necessarily gain an assured destruction capability if you're North Korea. Um, this is not a problem for the theory of the nuclear revolution. The theory of the nuclear revolution was really U.S.-Soviet. It was never meant to say that any country that ever gets a nuclear weapon will be able to deploy an assured destruction capability against the United States. Um, so in a sense, this is like a very small amendment to the theory, in my view, which is that if you took the view that assured destruction capabilities are literally easy to preserve, they're saying, well, maybe not so easy, but they can be preserved. If you preserve that assured destruction capability, then the logic in MAD holds, right? If, you, if both sides have assured destruction capabilities, force size doesn't matter, nobody can win, bargaining is all about resolve, um, arms races shouldn't happen if it's known, although you still might want to give it a try, although for reasons we'll talk about, that might be a bad idea. So this has gotten a lot of attention, but I sort of think that if you take this bottom line as a full part of their conclusion, um, it really reaches a quite drastically different implication. Brendan's work with Austin Long um, follows on this, but goes even further, be, um, sort of alerting us to the fact of historically what's happened was quite different than what we knew. So Owen Cote's work on submarines, you know, I think is, is pathbreaking. They draw upon that and add to it. It turns out that for various important periods of the Cold War, we did way better against Soviet submarines than we knew at the time. And I would say importantly, we not only did way better than we knew at the time, but we, they, we did way better than sort of the, than the, the, the physicist, Richard Garwin maybe in particular, who wrote this very good article in Scientific American said, you can make, you, countries can make their SSBN survivable. You can just win that competition. Um, and I think, I'm sure he was right at the, you know, at the, at the theory, at the technological limit that was possible and the United States actually achieved it. But importantly, the Soviet Union didn't. So this raises a question like, one, how do we analyze other states' forces? Like, and I'll come to this at the very end, like do we want to think at the technological limit? Well, that's interesting, but if states aren't operating at the technological limit, that's really not quite the way to evaluate them. Um, we did better at tracking um, IC, mobile ICBMs during the late Cold War, when the Soviet Union deployed rail and land mobile um, ICBMs as the follow-on to SS-18s. Um, and apparently there's not, at least when they wrote about it, there was not a lot known, but it turns out you do have to communicate between mobile missiles and command posts, between mobile missiles and the, the, um, the escorts and so on and so forth. And if you're not careful, which again, I think the Soviets were not careful apparently, you could, those communications can be picked up by satellites. My understanding from talking to technical people is if you are careful, you can communicate with burst communications and narrow bandwidths and so forth and avoid or greatly reduce the likelihood. Um, so once again, here's a situation in which those mobiles should have been survivable if they were operated very well, um, but maybe, they, maybe we tracked them because the Soviets didn't operate them very well, which is important. Um, okay, but 
I think I'm correctly, and see, Brendan is spying, so he can correct us. He's here today. But they said that, you know, if nothing else, these efforts cast a shadow over the nuclear balance. Second strike forces have been more difficult to generate than most experts acknowledge. And that's, I think, an accurate, good statement. But Brendan, in his, own, in his book and in his own work, does find that mutual vulnerability persisted throughout the Cold War. Turns out it was sort of like maybe bad luck for the United States. The periods in which Soviet submarines were vulnerable, their missiles were, sur were survivable. <laughs> and then as those missiles became more survivable, um, so on and so became more vulnerable, the submarines had improved and became more survivable. So it's sort of like they always had, and that's one of the points in general, is if you have multiple basing modes and work all of them, you've got a much better shot at having one that is survivable all you need at any given time is one that's really survivable, although you probably want to have many because you don't know what the future will bring. Okay, so this brings us though then to the third argument, which I think is the most important um, and potentially complicated, um, which is that if you try hard enough, you can generate uncertainty in the adversary's mind or confidence about their retaliatory capability. Um, and we did achieve this during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. There are a couple, a small number of quotes in Brendan's very carefully researched book where they actually are statements of like, maybe we really don't have a secure retaliatory capability. Um, I don't know how many there were or how prevalent they were, but you can imagine that was the case. If you look at the United States, we were much more capable and yet we worried all the time, if not about our current, then at least about our future vulnerability I think current is much more important for coercive reasons than future, but nevertheless. Um, so the argument is, first of all, so if all you have to do is create uncertainty, the level, the, the challenge for the competition is much easier for the damage limiter, right? You don't have to succeed. You just have to raise doubts in the retaliator's mind. And actually, you don't even, it's even easier than that. You only have to convince the retaliator that you believe you have or might have a retaliatory, I mean, a damage limitation capability because that, and your actions will depend upon what you believe, not what the defender or the retaliator believes. Um, and so if this is true, then if you have this kind of advantage, it could actually contribute to deterrence. Because if you think that I think I have a damage limitation capability, you should be more cautious because I might use it. So that could deter crises and escalation. And then Brendan goes on to argue that it also could drain adversaries' resources in a way that might be valuable, um, so, so draining that they would have to make concessions elsewhere because they might not be able to meet some of their secondary geopolitical commitments due to the drain on their resources. And since allies are consistently nervous and underestimate the quality of extended deterrent commitments, if you're competing it will make them feel better, and you might even you might even tell them this complicated story. Why well, no? We can't get into sure just you know damage limitation capability, but I can create uncertainty, and that's going to work. So all we need to do is get uncertainty. So this is a good argument. It it, it hinges on whether you can create uncertainty, but creating uncertainty is way different than succeeding for a variety of reasons, and so it, it holds together, and it's much harder to sort of analyzed and just in a narrow technological frame. Okay, so who's right? Where do we stand on this debate? Um, on assured destruction capabilities, I think it's the way it still says states can maintain their assured destruction capabilities. Major powers can maintain their assured destruction capabilities. Yeah, we've got all these qualifications about the Cold War, but the United States actually never, as far as we know, never succeeded. And the critics aren't saying we ever succeeded. They're just saying it took more work. So if you take off the table, the sort of straw man is easy and just change it to who will win, the retaliator will win, um, we're back to where we were because then you're in, the, in the, the, the core logic of mutual vulnerability, which is differences don't matter, no reason. And if you really believe that and that was all you had, then you should also go back and say, well, there's no use to arms race because we're just gonna end up in the same place. So the fact that it's not easy as long as you're sure who will win or think it's extremely likely who will win in this sort of damage limitation retaliation competition is sufficient to preserve most of the arguments. Okay, but how about assured destruction and uncertainty? Um, 
clearly will I think it will depend upon the state and the state of technology. I can't say it will never happen because apparently the United States generated some at least some uncertainty in the Soviet mind um, during the Cold War. And I actually think that the, the Soviets created some uncertainty on our side, to be perfectly clear about it. I mean, not so much on the when you look at forces, but the more you get into nuclear issues, command and control is the hardest to make survivable. And we worked very hard to get to an adequate level. Um, although I think there was no doubt in the end that we could retaliate, but we might only be re able to retaliate massively and early, um, not, in a, not during a sustained kind of um, large attack and campaign. So the question then on uncertainty is, um, how about other states? Like how about China today? How about China tomorrow? Can we continue to, today I would say both, so, both Russia and, um, but, all, but China also, I don't have Russia up there. Um, China, some uncertainty. The Chinese force is still growing. Their command and control is not quite mature. Um, they don't keep their forces on regular alert. We don't know if they quite can, but they will be able to launch on warning and so forth. So it's possible that some states, um, some of the time, you might be able to generate uncertainty, even if you didn't succeed. Um, and then the question is, as I'll get to next, um, do you want to do that? So I would say here, you know, I would say the theory of the nuclear revolution should yield some ground conditionally which is it becomes a dyadic issue. And the question is, who is the other state and how good are they? How capable are they? Um, you might be able to generate uncertainty, retaliatory uncertainty. Um, that's a, there's a whole bunch to be said about that, but that would be where, where I think that stands. There's another issue which I think is important and I, um, I think there's disagreement on, which was even if the United States achieved this, was it a coherent policy? Like did the United States say, we're gonna to try to limit damage. Did we have a coordinate strate nuclear coordinated strategic nuclear policy to do this? Um, or do we just have a whole bunch of separate programs which all, for a variety of reasons all push in this direction? Like the Navy obviously wanted to hunt submarines. The Air Force obviously wanted to, if, to the extent that it was not flying bombers, which is what it really wanted to do. Wanted to you know, target forces and that's just sort of what we, they'd always been done. But did anybody ever sit back and say, really let's look at the exchange calculations and realistic scenarios and see if by that doing all these things we can actually get a damage limitation capability or even the lower bar, which I don't think they would have used, create uncertainty. Um, Brendan argues, and I think others imply that it was a, you know, a, a well-planned coherent policy and we succeeded. I think there's way, uh, there are other explanations that are at least as compelling and we're not at the bottom of this. Um, but I've alluded to just sort of like what organizations would naturally do. Um, technological imperatives, which are related but separate from organizational sort of in culture. Um, conventionalization, just not knowing what else to do but compete. Like it's so unnatural to accept the logic of the nu The nuclear revolution, if you really take it on board, is quite revolutionary. You're not supposed to compete. Um, like what do you do? I mean, if you're not competing, it's really boring. Um, you don't get, you know, your forces get stagnant. You just replace them when it's, they've gotten really old. Um, there's no use to get newer and better ones. Um, so there's just like a lot of things that we're very, I mean, just are not intuitive and could explain the efforts of all the different branches to do this. But maybe it's in there somewhere. But, there, you know, there are very few, like there's not out there in the literature, like where are all the net assessments, the exchange calculations? The, the thresholds, like how many, war, what were the real number of warheads we had to reduce the Soviet retaliation to, to actually have a different outcome? You know, the, it turns out the McNamara numbers were way high, 200 megatons, way high, factor of three, factor of four, maybe way less depending upon other things. If you're trying to limit damage to yourself, you'd want to know those things, not just have these sort of arbitrary. Anyway, so that's all out there. So who's right? I think mostly I think, anyway, you'll see what on this. So we'll keep going. What are the policy implications? First of all, I mean, I do think that if we're gonna have this and gonna question whether you can really um, maintain assured destruction capabilities, then we really need full technical assessments. Right now, what we have are, you know, very useful heads ups, like counter forces getting better. But there's not a real countermeasures 
counter countermeasures evaluation. Like, so, okay, you have mobile missiles, but people have looked at it, think that you can deploy decoys, you can spook satellite sites, you can do all these things. Who's going to win that competition? That's the relevant competition, at least for technologically capable states. Who's going to win the ASW competition? You might say, oh, the United States is way better, but no, right now China has deployed a missile that with a single warhead is not talked about much, but has arranged to hit the United States pretty much everywhere. It's a MIRV missile, but with a single warhead, it could hit um, anywhere in the United States from a South Bastion in the South China Sea. So they're moving toward having the capability at least of having a protected bastion at home, in which case our ASW advantages are way smaller, not to say that they're, so what does that really look like as they get better and better? And I'm not saying I don't have the answer on these. I'm just saying until you answer these things, you don't know. Um, and of course, you, you don't never know what the future will bring. So there's always future uncertainty. But so we're at the very early stages, I think. Like in the Cold War, there was a huge debate over ABM and it was argued back and forth literally over decades by experts on both sides. Some were right and some were wrong, but they argued on both sides. Um, that was a little joke. Um, and... Um, but I think now we need to do this across the forces. And so I, um, and I know some people are working on this and, and so forth. But so we need to have like the next generation of like full and open analyses. Um, and, you know, I would say missile defense, I think, is, is it one of the easier ones up there. Um, NC2 is one of the harder ones. Um, but I think that for basic retaliatory capabilities, um, these are doable. Um, then there's another tricky question, which is, I think, put on the table by this argument that not states don't actually necessarily deploy forces at the technological limit, which is most Cold War work was very much like, what is the technological limit of submarines versus ASW or hard silos versus accuracy um, or air defenses versus um, radar cross section or whatever it was? And that's obviously a very good place to start, I think. But if you don't have a highly competent adversary, what we've learned is it's not necessarily a very good place to finish. But then you, if you could just say, well, maybe the adversary is not going to be so good, so we should just do whatever we can. That's not satisfying. So how do you scale for how good the adversary is now and will be in the future when you're thinking about developing plans over the next couple decades? Um, and if they're good, then you should look toward, if they're very good, look toward the technological limit. That's like when you're mostly dealing, it turns out, with the United States. Um, but maybe China will be that good. If it is, which I think maybe not going to be that good, but will eventually be quite good, then you shouldn't try. Then you're back in the deep nuclear revolution kind of logic. Um, and so there's a question about how much ground to give on all of this. Now, the final piece is that competition um, is dangerous. So what we've got so far is we've got, I would say, limited conditional benefits, conditional on the adversary of generating retaliatory uncertainty. Um, but at the same time, you can't do that without essentially creating all of the dangers of pursuing a highly competitive damage limitation capability, even if you don't succeed. Because if the adversary is uncertain about its capability, it will operate its forces and act during crises as though it's, it may be vulnerable. In fact, that, that it's the flip, it has to act that way, right? Because it's already, we're giving it the deterrent, we're giving the, the damage limit or the deterrent benefit of creating this uncertainty. That means the retaliator has to act accordingly. So what are the dangers? And this is just the standard laundry list. Um, so it means you have to alert your forces early in a crisis. Because if you're, particularly if you're defending upon mobile forces, um, you can't keep them out in the field all the time, although you may keep a fraction and should keep some fraction on alert some of the time. But you're going to want to mobilize as much of your force as possible early, which, dry, which will tend to drive a crisis forward for a variety of reasons. But one reason is that that puts potential pressure on the damage lim in limitator <laughs> to um, attack early while that window before your forces are all out of, in the field. Now, that's pretty early in a crisis, but if it looks like it's going to become a really big war or if it's a war over Taiwan and it's already likely to become an even bigger war, it would create incentives to go early. Also, we realize some of this, it will also create incentives if you have conventional capabilities against forces in garrison to use them very early. So if we get to the point where we have long-range 
ballistic missiles that are highly accurate. It will create those kind of window pressures. Um, the attacker, I mean, the vulnerable state may feel pressures also to escalate because some of your ability to limit damage may be vulnerable. So if you depend upon satellites to target mobiles, I may not, I may target your satellites. And I may just do that in a way that blinds them. I might do that in a way that, ha if I'm not confident that that will work, that shoots them down. So there might be a way to fight your way back to having an assured destruction capability, but that, will, that itself will be escalatory. Launch on warning. States that are highly vulnerable prepare to launch early. Um, they don't want to. It's, very, it, it, it's not easy to do. It's hard even for the best to do it. Um, and it's dangerous because of that. You just have a very tight timeline and you can make mistakes. You can misinterpret data that you wouldn't misinterpret if you had more time. Um, you have to, sometimes you may have to delegate. We did this during the Cold War in the European theater. We also had some amount of conditional delegation even in our strategic nuclear forces. If you're afraid you will lose communication between the center and the forces, you can delegate authority. Um, that enhances your retaliatory capability, but it increases the likelihood of unauthorized or mistaken launches. Um, and so once again, you get into these dangers. Um, Barry has written about inadvertent escalation. Caitlin Talmadge, who's coming here, has written about it. Um, if the adversary thinks that nuclear forces is already potentially vulnerable, the loss of nuclear forces in the conventional part of a war creates additional pressures for early escalation. And then finally, I think quite significantly, I mean, this is a very competitive, threatening policy. I mean, you're basically trying to take away a core requirement for a state's security. Um, and states notice this. I mean, we worried about it all during the Cold War. We imputed malign intentions to, this, to the Soviet Union. The United States, in its incredibly secure and capable nuclear force, is very worried about what the Chinese intend because they're building up their nuclear force, which is not a threat to our core capabilities, except for maybe our damage limitation capabilities. So it wouldn't be, I don't think it's going to be the key um, strain in the relationship. But it's an, it's an important additional strain, and particularly if you add it to conventional competition. So my bottom line on this is I'm, I think you can give some condition, you know, I'm willing to yield a little bit of space or some space conditionally, depending upon the adversary, to the possibility of generating uncertainty, but probably not the possibility of actually limiting damage. Um, but even if you do that, it's still not the right, the best policy. Because you're really competing I mean, against a major power like China, you're competing way at the, uns at, once again, to use uncertainty, way at the technological margin under very uncertain circumstances for a relatively small edge, um, and you bring all of these risks. So that's my sort of in-between position, but of course, I was around in the early days of this, so I'm probably not giving as much ground as some would like, but that's where I stand on it. And um, I actually haven't been working on this for a couple of years. I'm actually trying to finish a a book on US policy toward China, but I am going to try to write up some of these arguments as a review of that debate. So I look forward to your comments. Thank you. All right, it's forewarned. We're going to use a different style of QA today. Why? Because I'm up there. And so we're going to optimize on the most number of people asking questions. That's what we're seeing. And so everyone gets a question, and we've, we've run out of people who have asked first question. We'll go to a second round. You can ask a second question, but no three questions in a row. Okay? Raise your hands. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, so really interesting talk. Um, I have an interesting to compare to previous talks we've given to see how things have developed. Sorry, I can speak up. Um, so a lot of people, when they talk about damage limitations, sort of specifically focus on missile defense, hardening of silos. But one of the things that's not really discussed is sort of the preparation for militaries to fight, continue to fight for nuclear war, especially at the conventional level, which seems a little odd under the theory of the nuclear revolution. And so I'm curious how you think sort of those types of things fit into this that we saw during the Cold War. I think there's concern that we're seeing them again. And so I'm curious sort of how this preparation for militaries to fight through a nuclear war, even at the conventional level, fits into this sort of damage limitation theory of the nuclear revolution. Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it much. I mean, I must say that I mostly think that once the, the nuclear war starts, that unless it stays quite limited, um, that the, the implications of the conventional war are over, or, and the conventional war itself is, are overwhelming. 
Well, you would think. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, it shows I've been working on other things. I'm just I'm not familiar with arguments that much that way. I think that um, I don't think the conventional war would necessarily stop right away. I mean, it, it does depend upon which nuclear war you're thinking about. So if you're thinking about a war that starts as a pretty big war designed to limit damage, at that point, I think the conventional war has just got to be like a second becomes a secondary issue. I mean, these are huge attacks, right? These, I mean, it's the damage from just a so-called counterforce attack is going to, be, you know, is potentially will destroy a nation anyway, depending upon how it's constructed. Um, if you have a limited kind of nuclear war, which is a bargaining war, then you can reasonably see the conventional war continuing. But that's sort of the opposite of this end, of the end of the spectrum, which is sort of you're accepting mutual vulnerability and having the bargaining logic. And at that point, since you're bargaining over the conventional outcome, the, I would you know you would expect the war would continue, but it's on a very different scale. But I think maybe uh, there may be some discussions going on that I'm just not up on. So, but that would be my that's my my basic take on it. And we're going to go back and forth, side to side. So, yes. Yeah. Hi. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, go for it. No, you're up. Uh, hey, Charlie. Um, so this is sort of an empirically motivated theoretical question. And probably, Brendan, if not now, maybe later to talk about it. When we think about technology and sort of detection and vulnerability, uh, the generally accepted idea of sort of modern kind of command and control is that, you know, Brendan sort of, and sort of assumes that there's like this kind of slowly changing technological risk of being detected or, or being hidden or having your command control work or not. But the general thought is in the cyber and space world, you actually have the ability, it fluctuates wildly over the course of a, either a crisis or maybe even a competition. And I'm wondering what the implications of the fact that at any given moment, you don't actually know whether you know where stuff is or whether the opponent knows where your stuff is and like, it's more the rate of change that really matters and the fluctuations. In an actual conflict or in an actual or a crisis. Yeah, in a crisis. Or maybe even in competition. I think that I know I haven't thought about it so much. Um, I think that if you're on the on the reconnaissance side, I think the cyber one, you know, cyber is the total wild card. And so Everybody can might have some uncertainty because they just don't know about cyber, and I think that that actually does add to the uncertain. You know, that does support that you might be uncertain about your retaliatory capability. Um, although I think states are going to figure out ways to, you know, to sort of isolate a, a basic retaliatory capability. I'll, I mean, not completely, but um, so on cyber, I think it does. It, it's a, it's a new, an additional dimension of uncertainty, and if you can convince the adversary that you think you have a good cyber capability, which is unknowable, it will complicate things. On the Intel reconnaissance side, I'm not really quite so sure because I think you, I think you would know if you knew and wouldn't if you didn't. So if you're losing targets, you just can't target them. But maybe, um, there's, maybe there's a specific example of something you're raising that I'm not, yeah. What? So, you know, in the Navy terms, it's a battle of the first salvos, right? So if you have a good idea where everything is and you know that's gonna go away, at D plus one minute, right? That creates tremendous incentives to do. Yeah, something. yeah. Well, I mean, that's because I mean, I think there are these, you know, these types of strategies create, you know, windows for attack. It's like that's that's the equivalent of a mobilization window, right? Um, this is an intelligence window, but that, and yeah, so you've got that problem. I mean, and it, it can easily be the case that you have really, really quite good knowledge, both locationally um, and, and in terms of um, ISR early on. And not, and that's, that, that that adds that first kind of pressure that I was talking about, which is where you need to go early because you can't effectively attack later. So I guess it's an additional danger. All right, I'm going to go from side room to side room. How about on the side? Any questions here? Barry, <laughs> sorry to walk in late. I blame American colonies. Um, <laughs> I can't help but ask you what, what you think, if it's Brendan in this room, he might want to chime in. How do you think a three-quarter nuclear competition changes this kind of thing? Um, do you think it strengthens the case for the uncertainty side, or weakens it? Strengthens the case for the nuclear revolution side, or weakens it? I have my own priors here, which I won't advance. I'm more interested in what you think, and maybe if there's a moment we can hear what Brendan Yeah, yeah I've... I've um, I wrote a short piece on, but not on the uncertainty side. I mean, I think that 
if you just think about mutual vulnerability as, and the logic of MAD, and think now you've got three countries, each of which have assured destruction capabilities, you know, from a nuclear revolution perspective, it doesn't matter. Two is like three. Um, you can cover all the targets anyway. Um, and so, it, you know, you need to plan a little differently, but it doesn't require you to in increase your force size and so forth. I mean, a lot of people are arguing because we're going to face Russia and China, we need to drastically increase our force size. Um, but that's because they've got to, they want to target forces. And if you do want to target forces, which is U.S. doctrine, then obviously an additional adversary means you need larger forces. Now, on the uncertainty side, um, I'm not sure it would affect it in the sense that each country will still tend to think at least individually about its uncertainty in a dyad. If you knew that there were really like Russia and China were really like one country, you know, then that would, would mean you were even, it was even harder to, re, to generate uncertainty. Um, so the uncertainty question, it has a lot, I guess, to do with how you think about the alliance or the alignment between the other countries. Right now, we had, the debate hasn't been pushed that far. I think it's you know, mostly off the mark, which is the idea that we need you know, 3,000 warheads because we have to face Russia and China. But that's really a, that's a counterforce targeting issue, not an uncertainty issue. So I don't know if that, is that answer your question or skirts your... Hmm? <laughs> What's that? You said it starts. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure there's more to be... It was a great talk, Charlie. Really, this was fantastic. Thank you for organizing this problem so well. I have nine questions. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, one question. When we do nine rounds. There we go. Um, so uh, when we think about the dangers of uncertainty, um, what I come first to mind with is the danger of nuclear crises. And you don't quite have them on your list there. I think one lesson from the Cold War is that crises themselves are very dangerous because managing the spin-up of the forces is very hard and very dangerous. My exhibit A and exhibit B would be Sergei Plohi's book on the Cuban crisis, which I think is a sort of first go-to to read. He, his book came out about five years ago, and the whole point of the book was this crisis was a lot more dangerous than you think it was. Uh, and then Limits of Safety by Scott Sagan, which I think is a great book that everyone should still read, and other work on the Cuban crisis. Okay, and I could, we could have a whole argument about whether 83 was also a nuclear crisis, which I think it was, and let's we'll leave that aside. Uh, what happened in 62 was that the spinning up of the forces was, if you will, an experiment. A lot of things were happening that had not been tried before. And when governments do things they haven't done before, they often don't understand what they are doing, they don't know what the effects of it will be, and they can easily make a mistake giving rise to, I guess you'd call it accidental, or you're calling it inadvertent escalation. Maybe that's, you're putting it in that box, but I'm talking about how the crisis gets out of control. You know the whole story about B... Uh, B-59, B-58, the, the submarine that uh, <clears throat> nearly had a nuclear shootout with the U.S. Navy and came within one stuck camera guy <laughs> of having their commander be unable to get down into the sub and stop the arming of their nuclear weapon. Uh, and you know the whole story of the south-facing radars that were jury-rigged and the Americans didn't realize they were going to make a Canaveral launch look like a Cuba launch until it was too late. And uh, putting live weapons in the Whiteman Air Base without realizing that there were probably Soviet observers looking at that base. And if they saw a test coming out of there, they might think it was the live man, da, 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 all that. When I was thinking about the Ukraine crisis, the thing I thought missing from it was, hmm, you know, if we get into a nuclear crisis with the Ruskies, we better understand it's inherently very dangerous. Isn't a risk policy raising that risk? And shouldn't we, like, let's bring some Cold War history into this? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, well said. I think that fits. I mean, I'll make two broad comments. One, some of that does fit in, but is not completely covered just by the window pressures. Um, but I do think I agree. I think that, like, one thing about the the logic of the nuclear revolution is things should move slowly. There's no rush. Um, you can take your time. You can figure out what's going on. Um, so, on, and in a whole variety of ways. Um, and if your forces are survivable, particularly if you don't have to put them on increased or alert rate, all the better. Um, one thing about a damage limitation policy is that you have to act quickly. Um, as you say, you, you've never done it before, at, at least at full scale, so you don't know quite what's going to happen. 
the adversary hasn't seen it before. So all of a sudden, when you start moving mobile missiles out, I mean, mobile missiles are actually a move to make your force more survivable. But you can easily imagine somebody saying he's getting ready to attack. Um, it's not really like a logical move because you can attack from garrison, but that could be. So a whole variety of, it becomes a very complicated, quick, potentially quick moving, much more room for misunderstanding. Um, and it's not really even fundamentally about uncertainty. I mean, in the sense of uncertainty about um, about retaliatory capabilities, it's just the sheer complexity of a lot of things happening at once when moments seem to matter. Um, and like, just to make I mean, to make a fuller case for you know the nuclear revolution theory is nuclear war. I'm thinking about writing an article would just say let's ha let's make sure our next nuclear war is a slow one. You know, if the war goes slowly, it's going to stay small. Or is this going to be the most crazy thing that ever happened? But you could easily blow up the world instantaneously in a damage limitation world. Like, you just don't want to be in that world. I mean, there's, and I think Steve's examples just make it clear, like, so many things could go wrong. We haven't done this ever. Um, and we've never been close with the current force structure. Um, and undoubtedly, U.S. leaders don't know exactly all the things that are going to happen, just like they didn't know in the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's a, even it's a much bigger, more complicated force than it was. So yeah, so I take the spirit. I think the spirit of that is in part of the bigger spirit of um, the value of time, the, the risks of time pressure and action compared to the lack of time pressure and deliberation, that, deliberation that could actually be in this very other world. So, yeah. other side of the room. I'm standing up so I can see. Uh, Rich, I, yeah, I, I'm going to go to Rich because I've passed over him in a, inadvertently several times. No, it's fine. Um, I found the TNR review perfectly pitched, which means I'm in the Dunning-Kruger zone. <laughs> I was thinking I know enough to offer an external to the debate sense, but probably don't. So my impression as a non-nukes person but who has to both teach and occasionally administer general exams <laughs> on this debate, is that the conditions for TNR to hold are more knife edge than you're framing them. That a little bit of uncertainty unravels most of the thing. Eclipse 99% totality is not totality, I learned when I did not quite make it. And this feels similar. You seem to say like, oh, like a little uncertainty, I can admit that without unraveling. But I'm external to the debate. I'm, I'm not sure because it starts to feel like a pretty fundamental uh, source of uncertainty where I say, ah, I think that uh, the other side has high costs for war because I secretly, in my heart of hearts, think there's some slight chance that we might survive this thing. And there's a lot of bureaucratic and Sagan-esque incentive, like reasons why you might think that bureaucracies that are tasked with figuring out how to survive a nuclear war, even when it's unsurvivable, would come up with stories. And so it's not just uncertainty on the other side, it's uncertainty on your side. If you have even the slightest sense of optimism, then it unravels. And it feels to me like it then connects to your, um, what I'm feeling is a disjuncture between that you don't like the policy that comes from unraveling TNR, which is like, we don't want to live in that world, is I think what you said, versus is TNR empirically true? And at what level is that true? Does that make any no, sense? It, it makes, I think it's very successful brain -wise. <laughs> um, okay, so there's a good opportunity to say more. I mean, I think that one is what you say actually means that I think it makes the okay, so it it means the policy is even more dangerous than I was laying it out. But that's separate because the last thing you want is a country that doesn't have an assured destruction capability but thinks that there's some slight chance that it might launching a massive nuclear war because it's that, that, it's that much more likely to launch that war. So that makes it more dangerous. But your question is a more basic one about the theory. And so I think the theory and policy are not as 
maybe not as unrelated as you make out in the following sense, although maybe, I mean, I haven't thought about it quite like this. Is it, if because it's a bad policy, you shouldn't do it, which is you shouldn't push right all the way to the technological competition margin because T, the, world, the TNR world is attractive, um, then the policy and the theory are close. So like, um, but they're not one, I understand the theory is not, it's not one and the same. Except um, that there's a meta argument where having the theory be a certain way makes a difference in the world, which seems like well, why you want to No, I take the world. point, which is that I think that the thing I ha you had to make the judgment about, which I've done rather quickly here, to make the judgment about which policy you want, you have to take, you have to compare a whole bunch of apples and oranges which is hard to do, and then you could come to a different conclusion than I did. Like I said, the risks aren't worth the benefits. You could say, I think the benefits are, are, are worth it. If the theory, if you give no ground at all, then there's no trade-off, right? And so in that sense, if the theory is airtight and has no exceptions, then everything stays very clean. Um, so, I think it does really matter. Um, and I think that the, the way I see it now is that the, the world is just, it's not that clean. And so I'm willing to say it's not quite that clean, but that doesn't lead me um, where the critics are going, which is counterforce competition for damage limitation. And I think I'm comfortable with that. I mean, it just means that it's just not quite as clean. But let's go back and say, um, what does it mean to increase, I mean, one is like, you can take it different ways. Like, if, if I know I don't have a damage limitation capability, but I think the adversary thinks I might, then I should still act according to, to TNR, okay? But I'm creating uncertainty on his side for my benefit, which has, might have all these disadvantages. So you're also sort of, because of this world of mirrors, like what does he believe, or even what does he believe about what I believe, there's like many different places where people are making judgments, some of which are still within TNR and some of which are outside of it. Um, I accept it makes it messier. I mean, I just think that's the way it is, but um, it's not supposed, you know, a lot of things are even way messier than this and we have to make policies. So I think it, um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, I think it's a very good point. It, it, it is a, I wouldn't say TNR is on a knife edge, but I would say the complexity of the policy choice is greatly complicated by giving any ground on that possibility. Um, on the other hand, since, it, since the Soviets did way less well than we thought that we they would, we don't have a choice. Um, it may well be that in the future we don't, you know, that China will just be really good, in which case we're back in a pure, more pure TNR world. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So it's, I'm getting, you know, conditional. You have to give some, I mean, give some grounds conditionally because it's an empirical question. Although it's not only it's not only empirical about the exchange itself, but what people believe about it. Brendan raised his hand yet. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, so Charlie, I was at an ISA and there was a discussion about um, long-term funding for young scholars doing nuclear work with Stanton and MacArthur money. Ending, but one of the parts of the discussion that didn't come up was the nature of the type of research. So a question I have for you for the next generation of scholars coming up that are looking at the critique of TNR, where are the areas you think might be fruitful uh, to assist you in this pushback or to illuminate the discussion for it? Well, one, I mean, I think one is there's a very important ground for people who are doing technical work to understand the debate. So on the technical, a lot of this is technical, not all of it, but we really need to know. I mean, good to know, like, how hard really is it for a country to defeat, a, a, you know, a, a dense constellation of space-based radars? Because if it's easy, then even a not high competence state will win that competition. If it's really hard, then you have to have a high competence state. 
So, you know, which box you're likely to be in, like conditionally I'm giving ground, but you know, okay, so how do you decide? One way to understand the likelihood of which world you end up in is actually to have really good technical analysis. And, you know, there's a whole tradition and some people are here that, you know, do this. And I think that's actually an important part of it. It's been an important tradition, you know, part of the nuclear community for a long time where scientists who really rolled up their sleeves and worried about missile defense or accuracy or whatever. Um, but on the other hand, there's a question about comp like stake, a whole new a thing I hadn't thought of much about is like, how do you figure out the likely sort of technical and deployment competence of an adversary? Right. So I'm saying like, maybe you need to look beyond the technical frontier to think about what the equilibrium will be, not just best against best. So, you know, you can do it in a classified way, but then it's always at the given moment. But could, like from political scientists, I mean, I think it would be. I don't know how to do it, but we, we, ha we have things that suggest in that direction that we might be able to tell which types of states will be relatively better at this and which types will be very good. And if you knew which type you were facing, and of course you looked, and if you're, then your expectation was reinforced, that would be very informative. Um, it would never dominate just like straight intelligence about what they're doing, but it would be a political science type contribution to reasonable expectations. So I think those two go together, right? Like, how hard is it and how competent is the, are the, is the set of potential adversaries help give some sort of answer? Um, I guess the third is maybe, I mean, I hope to do this just like in some of this review, but it's like really like what are the real, what is the real critique here of the nuclear of the theory that we need to deal with? I don't think it's, I mean, I think it's a lot of stuff out there and, you know, Rich teaches it and maybe, and well, knows it well enough, maybe, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him general exam, you know, next week. We're going to have to go through. And I don't know if he should be teaching this stuff. You know, and, uh, um, or if I should be, for that matter. I've, there's all this stuff I haven't read. And uh, no, but I mean, I think to understand what the real nature of the critique is. I mean, right here you have President Lieber are saying major powers can stay in mutual vulnerability. Yet there's been this whole, like, revision of counterforce, like that we should compete. Those two things don't go together. Right there, if you take that conclusion, they should be saying against major powers, we, there's no real reason to pursue this. You know, pursue it if you think that basically North Korea is not going to be able to retaliate, but don't pursue it against China and Russia. I don't think that's quite how people read it. You know, because there's all this stuff on the technology, but then there's this bottom line. The important thing is the bottom line. So also, let's clear up some of the debate. And even in the Cold War, even the Soviets were pretty incompetent. It turns out. I mean, some of the stuff they just should have done better given that they had a very capable adversary, um, we are still stuck in MAD. So how much do you want to play the uncertainty game if you're really stuck in MAD? I mean, that's a, that's a theoretical question as much as a competition and technological question because it has to do with your strategy. My sense is sort of consistent, I think, what I offered, but reinforced by Steve's um, comment is that like, boy, that counterforce competition world is a very dangerous world in a crisis. I mean, one that, you know, whatever I, in other words, what my thing is, you don't, the deterrent advantage is not worth the whole set of risks and the whole political competition that precedes it. But let's have a really big debate on that. I mean, that's like the next step in the, I mean, I've sketched it, but that's the next step in a way in the strategy debate between these schools if you're not willing to take it completely off the table. And I think some people just say, oh, you're giving these guys too much leash. I mean, you're, are you kidding me? We're going to look at countries that have thousands of nuclear weapons and we're going to talk about creating, you know, co competing to create this uncertainty. I'm open to that. You know, I'm a little bit more open maybe than I should be. A lot of people will just say, take that off the table. Don't give any ground. That's a good debate to have and that's not a technical issue. Or it's only slightly a technical issue. Yeah. So I'm going to obviously take the chance to apologize that I am entirely unfamiliar with a lot of this debate. Definitely not my wheelhouse. Um, but one of the things that struck me is that, for lack of really a better way to put this, I get the impression that while we have nuclear weapons, the delivery mechanisms for them are not exactly unique. And so when we talk about wanting to limit the degree of investment in this uh, like counterforce capability, the you know this damage mitigation capability, we kind of end up doing that regardless. You know we don't 
you can say we don't want, we aren't going to at all reasonably be able to defend against an entire swarm of ballistic, um, sorry, ballistic missiles, right? But we're still going to be developing, you know, weapons capable of countering individual attacks. And, you know, we aren't, we may not want to be directly countering the ability to hide an SSBN somewhere up in the Arctic, but we are going to want to monitor a submarine that gets near one of our ports, right? Same thing with hypersonics, you know, obviously a large swarm of them, again, is probably going to overwhelm what we have, but I mean, we obviously heard a ton about it in the Ukraine war whenever somebody would say, oh, Russia is prepping a nuclear capable missile. They aren't actually doing that. They're just scrapping a conventional warhead on a delivery mechanism so I think that I can already get that, there. I mean, I think that there is a problem <laughs> with limiting some of this capability. Um, and so if you want to do it, there's a question about like, how can you do it? So for example, um, one of the key things we will do if we're going to go against mobile missiles is we're going to have very dense space-based radar constellation, satellite constellations. We might want to do that anyway for a bunch of reasons, okay? So you've got this problem. One of the most natural things to limit to make these missiles survivable is something you might do because you want real-time intelligence in a conventional world. So it raises the question what else you can do. And so, I mean, I have some thoughts on this, but I, the point is well taken, which is that some of, the, some of this is dual capable. In the sense, you might do it only for conventional. Some of it's out of the box. Like missile accuracy is so high that any missile we build is going to be able to destroy with high confidence any silo, unless we went like some bizarre way out of our way to not do that, which we won't. So how do you do, you know, it is a really good question. If you wanted to stay, not compete, what would you do? There are certain things that are easier than others. Um, you know, I think that you could limit the size of your missile defense, which we're implicitly doing, but it turns out that, that creates, there's all sorts of problems with that. Um, so anyway, so it's a separate question, but I take the point. Um, it's not, a, it's the, the technologies are not unique to, your to a nuclear damage limitation capability, and it makes it harder. Now, I will say, I'd like to give you an example, however, like if we're gonna, the likelihood is that China will be able to get its missiles out of garrison and we have to barrage them. Um, we can figure out, given the intelligence we have, how many weapons we need to barrage each of their missiles given the time that we knew when it was there. Um, and we can, uh, we can agree to not have that many warheads. And so if you think about, for example, the number of warheads that are required to deal with the new silos, and then think about the number of warheads that are required to barrage the number of mobile missiles China will have, we could actually set a warhead limit or an EMT limit on our force and would not be able to barrage their force unless we had like terminal maneuvering targeting, which we don't have. So there's an agreement there on the table you could have. Um, of course, you'd want to give, it's only an agreement that would work if you were willing to give up that capability which of course the whole problem with arms control has been we've never been willing to give up that capability and we've always done all the other things around it. But if you wanted to, that's a, that would work in this case. Now the, in the, the question might be, well, what would China give us in exchange? Because they don't threaten our capabilities at this point, so on and so forth. But that's a specific example that I think is interesting. Um, there might be other things you can do also on, on, on radar limits. Um, but anyway, so, but it's, so it's not an easy problem. Yeah, let me go to Eric Pickenbotham's presentation and wait and then Daniel. Yeah, actually, I'll kind of build on this question and also on, I think, if I understood you correctly, your earlier statement that this is prescriptive and not predictive, right? Um, so obviously, actions that countries take in actuality, whatever the prescriptive uh, advice might be, can either enhance or detract from the revolutionary nature of the nuclear revolution, right? So by the end of the Cold War, we were banning, you know, ballistic, ballistic missile defenses and, and or at least limiting them. And, uh, and MERV warheads we've now moved away from this, or at least the world is moving away from this. I guess my question is, if it's really pre uh, prescriptive, if the theory is prescriptive, uh, what does that mean for... For, the, for its limitations and who it's limited to. So if it's prescriptive and not predictive, is China doing the wrong thing by building up 
and it, it's building up. I mean, is this limited to the top two? And we've got how many nuclear powers? So does that mean all of the rest are have to rise to the level um, at which they become, you know, at which they acquire a second strike capability against the sort of maximum threat level? And then what does that yeah. do with regard to whether or not we have a security challenge? Okay, so lots of he got away with both of asking multiple questions. Did you notice that? Penalties, penalties <laughs> Um, so I think that the theory is prescriptive, and if states have, um, act uh, um, otherwise, chances what I mean, what I would say is that it turns out the world is more dangerous than it needs to be, and they're just following the wrong policies, but doesn't undermine the theory of the revolution. And um, those states should be advised to act differently. So I am making a difference between the theory itself, but the theory has an empirical as we've seen, as an empirical foundation, which is the competition will lead to equilibrium and mutual vulnerability. It applies um, to, you know, to major powers that have the capability to, to generate that equilibrium. And here I'm putting aside the uncertainty and the additional nuance of the critics. Um, so then is China doing the wrong thing? No, China's doing the right thing because a major power should want to have a retaliatory capability in which it's highly confident. And China does not have that. And so the theory would say, and a lot of other just straight up deter nuclear deterrence theory, I mean, there's all the, there's sort of a, a spectrum from just basic deterrence theory and then nuclear deterrence theory and then the nuclear revolution. But basic deterrence theory would say, you know, you don't want the adversary to be able to inflict much more damage than you can. You want to make sure the adversary also doesn't have an incentive to try and achieve a better outcome by attacking your force. So China should want a highly survivable, I would say diversified, retaliatory capability, and it doesn't have that yet. Can I ask a follow-on? That would yeah. be your third question. Let no, you. I know, but okay. So, well, come back so you get Dan, you're, I'd like to come back to you. Can I get Daniel in? And we're running out. We're down to ten minutes. Daniel. Uh, my question actually sort of relates to that. I mean, so you're saying that you know, TNR only applies to major powers who can like, get this equilibrium then? So I'm just like trying to understand what countries I should think about when I think about TNR. So if TNR only applies, like, so it's unclear that that is sort of what I'm looking for then, are the nuclear dynamics then among non-major or non-super nuclear powers different? Is that competition looking differently? And if so, then like, what, what might be some of your theoretical expectations yeah. of that competition? I think it's, yeah. So I think that, like if you look just at earlier nuclear strategy arguments, and you know, if you could get a good damage limitation capability, it's actually it might well be worth getting for a variety of reasons. It would enhance your deterrent. It would protect you if there's an all-out war. It would have some cost, but it might have advantages, um, and particularly if it would be very effective. So it's a bit of a technical question. I use major powers loosely because we think they have the wealth, even facing major powers. Now, if you're a middle power and facing another middle power that's actually small or medium size, so you need way fewer weapons to destroy it. Um, and if that country cannot destroy most of the, you know, once again, if you if two countries, middle powers, can, in interactive competition, can build their functional equivalent of assured destruction capabilities, which would be smaller than for the United States and the Soviet Union, because there's more and more targets, right? You're not about destroying, a, in some sense, a country as a meaningful entity, or however you want to, all different ways to put it. Smaller countries are easier to destroy. Um, so you'd actually have to figure out for each dyad, what's the equivalent of an assured destruction capability or the equivalent of the denial of a damage limitation capability. If their, comp if their competitive equilibrium creates a kind of mutual vulnerability, then they're essentially in the same logic. And if one side or both can actually undermine the other side's full assured retaliatory capability, then they're not. And then you have to make a very different set of choices is damage limitation when it's quite significant, worth it. And we have all these risks of time pressure and so on and so forth that we've talked about, but it would ha might have very clear benefits, particularly if it was mutually understood that you are much more vulnerable. So, I mean, in that sense, the, the theory identifies its boundary conditions, right? And it's, in a sense, it's, its key boundary condition is that competition will lead to this equilibrium with some confidence of mutual vulnerability. All right, we've got about five minutes left. Let's see if we can squeeze in a few more. 
<laughs> James. <laughs> um, thanks, Charlie. Uh, I have a little bit different flavor of question. Um, so, especially in the policy world, I, my understanding is that there, all, there is also um, I think a great division between policymakers about uh, which side is more correct, TNR versus the opposition side of the TNR. And I'm curious about like how you think about the argument that their decisions to believe which side is more correct is often not based on like logically or empirically grounded evidence, or, but based on like their their perceptions or um, their personal preferences to believe which side is more correct. So, that's I'll, I'll offer my thought on that, but I have no comparative advantage compared to anybody else in the room in answering it. <laughs> um, I think certain people do have inclinations to, to like the, they just their worldview or even or just their personal view is it's good to compete with an adversary. And other people don't. And so if you're choosing between two different sets of arguments, one of which leads you to build up really big forces and compete with an adversary and strive for advantage, and another one which is like really cooperative and wimpy and says you really shouldn't try, some people will like one and some people will naturally be inclined to like the other and it could influence their choices. Um, and it will help influence how they adjudicate the trade-offs, because if you get into this apples and oranges situation that I was accepting, then you know it really is it, it's subjective. I mean, I think that at length, Van Ever and I can make a pretty good case that the dangers of this high-intensity unknown crisis are just too large, and the benefits are too small. But you can't lock it down the way you can lock down like the t totally self-contained logic of um, of mutual true mutual vulnerability. Now, once again. One thing I try to say is that like, which is right, even when I'm giving some ground, but I'm also saying it's conditional. Like it might well be that we're gonna face an adversary in China in which we cannot reasonably generate uncertainty. Um, in which case, then we're back into this more pure and simple world and it's a technical question and you don't get involved in those judgments so, so much. Now, even technical things people tend to see through their own so, you know, and then, then it's even harder. So you're going to probably always get divergence. I mean, there were, in the Cold War, I think the evidence on missile defense was very clear. It was not going to work against a, a reasonably sophisticated reactive threat. The United States did lots of things that didn't make sense given that. Um, that you, that's interesting to explain. <laughs> um, so on and so forth. But anyway, that's uh, just a sort of. Brendan, can I, let me just go one at a time. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm very grateful for the generosity. But you treated the argument. Uh, uh, you could have been much tougher on me, so that's very nice of you. Uh, I guess I just uh, I want to ask a question and talk about this list that's up on the last slide of sort of how we count the costs of a damage limitation policy, right? And so to radically simplify, a bunch of those bullets are about what we might call different flavors of back to mad strategies, right? Which is that there's some kind of damage limitation capability, but there's incentives for the adversary to fix that in some way, right? Um, and so theoretically those, those incentives exist, right? Which is that you know, you, you'd, wanna, you'd wanna get the balance of power back to neutral or stalemated. Um, on the other hand, the opposite set of incentives exist, which is that maybe you're terrified now and you would not rather take the risks of doing many of the things that are you're going to have to do to get back to mad because the other side can preempt and he knows that he's stronger than you right now and so you know how would we decide theoretically well, which is more likely well there's lots of factors you know your resolve your beliefs about the other side there's a bunch of different things um and so i guess the question i have is what do you think we know empirically mm -hmm. about how these decisions have been re resolved Right, and so I'm gonna just gonna give you a stylized, biased list of, of data points that I've cherry picked, um, and about which I'm aware there's some historical debate. Uh, and I just like to sort of hear your response, right? Um, so pressure to mobilize forces early, right? So sure, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think everybody agrees that the Soviet Union was quite vulnerable in the early Cold War, getting into the mid Cold War. Um, lots of Basic data coming out of the government uh, from the big crises in the early 60s that the Soviets were very slow to mobilize their forces 
in the face of, for instance, U.S. bombers circling around the pole in the 61 Berlin crisis, right? Um, what do we know about, uh, you know, command and control policies uh, for nuclear weapons of nuclear states, right? Let me, let me stop you there since we're about one minute okay. away. So that, that's my question, right? Yeah. Which is, I, I feel like I can come up with a, a bunch of examples that would say, well, it's, it sort of seems like states, the ones that we have, seem like they've been biased against trying to get back to men. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. And maybe, and I think I would say, we don't have a ton of evidence, right? But I'm curious to hear how you evaluate it. Ones, I mean, I agree. I mean, I take your point. I think the data is thin, and I don't know. I mean, we'd have to look at the Berlin crisis carefully, but I'm not sure. It's, I worry way more about the mobilization issues and interactions that been even mentioned with Cuban Missile Crisis. But I think it's also with all these things, we're sort of rolling the dice, and it's good to look at the history, but a lot of things that are plausible, we haven't seen, but if they seem sufficiently plausible, that I would worry about them. So if you've told me you've never seen it, I would say that that doesn't, that doesn't really, I mean, maybe I'm just dense about this, but it doesn't really reduce my my willingness to believe that it might still happen and it's not, and it might even be likely. Um, so, I mean, I, if we'd had lots and lots of data, then it would be, it might be somewhat different, but particularly like with, yeah, so anyway, so that's just my basic reaction. Um, and I, I, I mean, we could, it, it is, it, it's not, it's a legitimate thing to try and do. I, I, I accept that, but I don't, it makes so much sense at least like getting missiles, mean, you know, attacking satellites early, you know, anyway, so just on specific things, like you're going to get your missiles out of garrison. The, you know, the Chinese are already starting to, to do this more and more for practice. If they have strategic warning, it's just they've got to do that. Um, I mean, I think if they, they might not, they might think that they might misjudge the crisis. If they think it's going to become a big conventional war, they're out of garrison. If we think they think that, we have incentives to use conventional weapons maybe against those garrisons. Although that's really risky, et cetera, et cetera. I just think it's too, there are too many plausible stories. And I say stories because I think they are, but that just doesn't strike me as. So with, uh, with apologies to your historical knowledge. We're, we've now arrived at the end. Let me ask, is there someone who had a, and, I, and by this I mean anyone other than named Eric, is there someone with a really burning desire? They have to ask this question, the final question. Other than Eric, Raymond, did you have one? No? Okay. Then will you uh, join me in thanking Charlie? Thank you. Thank you.